Ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure we announce our special guest, Robert Creighton. Robert Creighton is an actor, singer, dancer, composer, and author. Thank you so much for joining us. Paul, it's my pleasure. I think most stories are best from the beginning. What was life like growing up? Well, that's, yeah, that's, that is the beginning. And you know what? I grew up in a little town north of Toronto in Ontario, Canada. And as most lads in the town I grew up in dreamed of a career in the NHL, being a goaltender on the Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> but that dream was rivaled by my dream to be Fred Astaire. I was, at a very young age, um, by my parents, introduced to the old movie musicals. And for some reason, I just had an affinity for them right off the bat. Those were the things... When people ask me about the cartoons or the things you remember from childhood, I remember my parents letting me stay up late to watch the black and white films, you know, and then carrying me to bed halfway through when when I fell asleep. And that's sort of how the dream of being in New York and on Broadway and my love for music of that era, that's how that all began. And then I was in a boys' choir for many years, which was really a musical foundation for me for Eight years I sang from the age of seven, sang in a boys' choir, and got great training in that way. And then at 15, I went away to a a school, a boarding school, where they had really great arts program and all the sports stuff so I could do sort of everything at once. And then I did a degree in music in in, uh, Ontario and then moved to New York, which was always the plan from a very young age, and studied acting for three years and sort of carried on from there. Of the various things that you do, Acting, singing, dancing, composing, writing. Would you say that one is more your master than the other? Yes. I think that my foundation is probably my sensibility as an actor first. My training was both musical and in uh, in acting, but I think acting was my first. Although singing has been the biggest part of my life, that's for sure. But I would say there's... I've been very lucky. I work a lot. I'm in my currently my sixth Broadway show and loving it and I'd say there's lots better singers better dancers and all that sort of thing but I have a package that sort of suits me I love to you know I love to do all of it and luckily I've been getting to do all of it so I feel very fortunate you mentioned earlier Fred Astaire what are some of the other artists that have influenced you in the path of becoming an artist yourself well certainly uh, from a from a young age, it was Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly, Judy Garland, and all those greats from that era. Then when I got to New York, and certainly I used to try and imitate them all the time as a kid, had a lot of fun doing that. And then when I moved to New York, I was in acting school, and a, and a teacher said, you remind, you remind me of Jimmy Cagney. And I am sort of built, I'm built just like Jimmy Cagney, look, look quite a bit like him, you know, and tap dance and do all those sorts of things. And I didn't know much about him. I knew sort of Yankee Doodle Dandy and maybe had seen a couple others, but didn't really, wasn't really on my radar in a big way. I started watching his films and instantly became mesmerized with who he was as an actor, first of all. Just you, just his, um, he's so dynamic on screen, you t- can't take your eyes off him. And, and I, at that point when I was really studying the craft of acting, really felt like he was someone who was ahead of his time in terms of his craft and all of that. And, and then as I started reading about the man and who he was as a person and how he worked and what his philosophy was on life and on his work, I just fell in love with who he was. And I think he's been, James Cagney, I would say, has been the biggest influence in that way and subsequently dreamed of writing a show about his life, which is, uh, which thanks to some collaborators who know a lot more about doing musicals than I do, uh, we put a musical together that's had a lot of success. We've had three successful runs and we're plugging away at that, so... What was the experience of working on co-authoring and conceiving this Cagney show? Well, first of all, sorry, when I got out of acting school, his estate, Cagney's estate, run by a woman named Marge Zimmerman, was they had a play that had been written by a, sort of a friend of theirs, of Marge's, and it, they held massive auditions around New York and everywhere, and, and I was just coming out of acting school. I guess it was about a year and a half out of acting school, and it got down to to me and one other guy, and it's actually vivid memory, and in fact, I have the audition on videotape because it's the first time I've ever been picked up in a car. They sent a car for me and went up to uh, this restaurant in Stanfordville that um, this woman, Marge Zimmerman, owned, and all of Cagney's old friends were there. This was in 94, 
and all of Cagney's friends were there, Floyd Patterson, the boxer, and different people, and I had to do a 15-minute sort of little act, and it subsequently got the part, but it turns out the play, and now, as I know Norm, more about creating a show now, was really what, there was nothing theatrical about it, it was just sort of a biographical telling, and it, we workshopped it a bit in New York, and it just fizzled out, and subsequently the man who wrote it, who wasn't really a writer, he was a marketing guy, he passed away, and the, the project just sort of fell apart. But that lit a spark in me that someday I'm going to do a show about James Cagney. And then in the late 90s, I really started putting pen to paper for a one-man show about his life and sort of conceiving how that would, you know, what, what I want, the story I wanted to tell about who this person was. And, and then in 2002, I was playing Timon in Los Angeles in production of Lion King there, and a gentleman who I had done a play of his up in Canada who lived in Los Angeles, I invited him to see the show. I met him when he came to see our, our production in Canada. And we got chatting afterwards. His name's Peter Cawley, very successful playwright. And I got chatting with him about my ideas about Cagney. He said, well, I love that year of Hollywood, and I love James Cagney, and let's have lunch and talk more about it. So we started talking, and he really brought... So I brought all this passion about Cagney and wanting to do the show, and he really brought this knowledge of how to craft a piece and make something theatrical. And we sort of hashed out a story together, and then he began writing it, and I would sort of take it and be sort of the eyes of, I'm mean, sort of the Cagney aficionado, let's call that, and, and sort of using my instincts as an actor, and we sort of crafted the piece together, and I started writing music and lyrics. We sort of tried to put in songs of the era, but when we when we found that they couldn't completely tell the story... I started writing music and lyrics myself, which I had done some of before, and they, they started to fit pretty well. So we kept going on that route and finished one draft of my music and lyrics and his book and a couple of the old-time songs, Cohan songs and things, which, of course, you can't do a story about Cagney and leave those out. We did that, and then for a theater in Florida Stage saw a reading of it in New York and agreed to produce it, and they introduced us to a guy named Christopher McGovern, who helped me flesh out the score and, and ended up really writing more than half of the score and uh, is a tremendous, just a, an amazing composer and smart about putting a musical together. And the last piece was a director named Bill Castellino who really sort of helped us break that all down and then build it up in a much better way. He sort of served as dramaturg. And we, so we've got a piece now that, that we're still working on, but really we found that audience was really respond to. We won the Carbonell Award in Florida for Best New Work when we did it, produced it down there, and then we had and we set two box office records in Florida, and it's been a very exciting journey. And probably for me, the most even as much as this album, this new album that's coming out, it's been like a baby to me. Those are the two things that have really sort of been a dream in my head, and then have come to fruition, and that are so so satisfying on every level. Plus, I got to star in it, of course. So you know, it was satisfying on that level too. I wanted to talk about the album, the new album coming out, Ain't We Got Fun. What do you think of your new album? Ain't We Got Fun was the, one of the first. I had two titles that I was sort of playing with at the beginning. The other one was just old school, Robert Craig and old school, and Ain't We Got Fun because I love that song and I knew I wanted it on the album. And, and really it was right from the beginning what I thought would be the title of the album because I wanted that to be the nature of the album. I wanted it to be really fun and really something that uh, people could, you know, most of the songs on there, even if you don't know, you know them, you know them. You've heard the melodies before. They're so ingrained in, our, in the fabric of our culture here. And I have two original songs on there that I wrote for Cagney, but the rest, and I've been told they blend in well. Some people don't know that those are the ones that are literally from the 20s and 30s. So I really wanted it to be fun, and, and I put on there songs that, that I love that get stuck in my head and that I find myself walking down the street singing. And in Like Cagney, it was sort of a project that I conceived and really was passionate about doing it because I, I, I just love that music so much, and I thought it would be a great thing to have when I go do my Cagney show to have in the, in the lobby so people love this music and take it with them. And then I was introduced to, or I came in touch with Georgia Stitt. I did a workshop of her of a musical, Hello, My Baby, that she was writing, and it had some of this old music in it, and her her arrangements were so great, and she is so talented and such a great person. I started talking to her. I said, hey, this is my idea. Would you maybe like to get involved? And she jumped in with both feet and produced and arranged my most of my album and just sort of gave this fresh take to to these songs, and I would sort of... Some, some of them were just, she would say, why don't we do it like this? And others I would say, I want to I wanna do it like this. And then she would put these two songs together, and then she would sort of figure out the puzzle of how to do that. 
it was a great collaboration, and it grew into something that I didn't expect. I thought it would be this little thing that people would take with them, and it, and it grew into a, a really legitimate album that I'm very proud of, that with horn sections and band all the way through and emotion and a lot of fun. So that's what I wanted. It started out, I wanted it to be fun, and that's where the title came from, and, and I, I feel like we accomplished that. So I'm, I'm excited to, for people to hear it. Do you have a favorite song from the album? Ooh, that is a tough one. That's a tough question. Do I have a favorite song? Well, my favorite song, which is a song that's been, I just was looking up on the internet, I think they said something that's been recorded 1,400 times by 600 artists. So it's not like anyone was clamoring for the next version of I'll Be Seeing You. But it is truly, since I was, I think, 21, in my early 20s, I did a, a review where I got to sing that song. It's been one of my favorite songs. And in our treatment of it, a guy named Joe Bergstaller played flugelhorn. And his playing on there, the singing of that song, and then when he added the flugelhorn, I, I just can't get enough of listening to the, that part of it, him playing his flugelhorn. It's just so beautiful and romantic and passionate. and So that one, I like that one. I really enjoyed singing and putting together Accentuate the Positive and Look for the Silver Lining with my friend Titus Burgess, who sang with me on it there. I think that's a real highlight of the album. It's a big arrangement, lots of, you know, with the horn sections and all that. I love I loved doing that one. And then, of course, getting to sing with Joel Gray, who recorded Give My Regards to Broadway with me. We're working together in Anything Goes right now and become good friends, and he, he agreed to sing with me. That's just a moment in time that uh, was a gift to me that I'll have forever. I mean, he's such a, a legend and just a, a great man. And so we got to go in the studio and do that together, and so that has great sentimental value to me. How did you go about selecting which songs that you were going to record? That was a, a bit of a process because, of course, there was a long list of, of great tunes from that era to choose from and ones that I love to do. And who knows, maybe there's another one coming, some, another album coming someday because there's a lot that I wanted to do that we, we didn't do. I knew I wanted to put my two of my two these two of my original songs, Crazy About You and Fallen in Love, on there because there are songs that I had hadn't recorded in a really we have a demo for the musical of course but I wanted to record them in a really full way because I really I enjoyed writing them I love singing them so I, I knew those were going to be on there and then I knew I needed to have some George M. Cohan and Yankee Doodle Dandy has sort of been my signature song for years and years since that first review where I sang I'll Be Seeing You I did a I did a big version of Yankee Doodle Dandy and that's I've done you know that's my been my party song for years so I knew that was going to be on there and then when Joel agreed to sing with me, uh, you know, I, I wanted it to be a Cohan song because, of course, he originated the role of George on Broadway, and that was just a great connection that we have because of the Cagney thing. And then the other ones, it just came down to a lot of the songs that I just can't get out of my head. My Buddy is a, one of the most beautiful melodies ever, I think, and I used to just walk around humming it. I thought, well, I better do that and get it out of my head. The first track on the album is Dad's Medley, and those were two songs that I remember singing when I was three and four years old, Ain't She Sweet and Five Foot Two. My dad used to sing him. My dad's not a, uh, <laughs> and he would tell you this, I'm not speaking out of turn, he's not much of a singer, but he loves to sing and dance, and he used to sing those all the time, and I remember singing them with him in the living room when I was three and four years old, so I wanted to have a little dedication to him and put, and put those songs together. Yeah, they were just, it's basically my favorite. You Are My Sunshine is on there, which I got to sing with one of my best friends, Heidi Blickenstaff, who's just one of the most remarkable voices. So it, was, it came down to a lot of the, my favorites, really, to be honest with you. And there's more to be, there's more to be mined from that. I, I Want a Girl Just Like the Girl was one of my other favorite tunes of the era. And it was George's idea to do that with a male quartet. And so I had, that, was really, that turned out to be a really neat track because I got four of my buddies, great Broadway singers, to um, do this barbershop quartet backing me up on that one. So that was fun. Yeah, it was, tough, it was a tough selection, though. I'll tell you one song. Paul, Wrap Your Troubles in Dreams. Did you know that song before? I, I did not know that song before. Yeah, and, and neither did I. It turns out it's been recorded a, a ton of times, but I, and I, I know the music of this era pretty well. I, I had, for some reason, had not heard that song, and neither had Georgia. And she was doing a show called Hello, My Baby about it, and I was going through a, or about, you know, that old music, and, Tim Pan Alley, and, and I was going through a, a, a thick book, just sort of reading lyrics and, you know, I had most of the songs I wanted to do, but I was just looking through to see what I was missing. And, and I read the lyrics, and then I sort of plunked it out on the piano. I was like, oh, my gosh, this 
song. I love this song. And I just walked around for days singing it. And as soon as I introduced it to Georgia, and she sort of played it out one time when we were together at a piano, and like, oh, yeah, yeah, we've got to do this one. And that turned out to be a really fun track, too, with brass and the whole the whole deal. But it's such an up such an up song and sort of reflects my philosophy on life and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. So that's probably a longer answer than you wanted, but that was the process for choosing the material. Well the album your album is entitled Ain't We Got Fun, the new album from Robert Creighton, well debut album. And the album yes. is produced by Georgia Stitt. She is a person that's name comes up a lot on this show. Oh great. What was the experience of working with her like? I can't say enough good things about Georgia. I mean, she is, I think her name's coming up a lot because I think she is a really rising presence in the musical theater world and composition world. She is, first of all, I mean, the basis is she's just super talented and super smart. And then she has a really great ear for arrangements and how to flesh things out, take a, take just a simple song and then and make it something that's going to be really fun to listen to. And she's really smart about putting that all together. I feel like and I said this to her just the other day. She lives in L.A. now, but was visiting New York. And I said, you know, I really couldn't have done this without you. And that, and I feel that way. I mean, she, she just, she took my idea of doing this album and some of the songs and things, and then just came up with, you know, just made it, made it all better, which was great. We had a very easy collaboration in that way. Some of the songs, she would say, hey, what do you think of this? this is like uh, my buddy, it was her idea to do just guitar and the bossa feel, bossa nova feel, and. Yeah, I think it's just such a nice breath in the album, you know, amongst all the other fun and up songs. And then, for example, and then most of the, all the sort of medleys that were my idea, and then she would just figure out, you know, the math of putting those together. For example, the Barbershop Quartet, that was her idea. On the opening track, there's a kazoo, which turns out was her husband's idea. You know, we were figuring it out and, and she played what we had for her husband, Jason Robert Brown, and he said, oh, what about a kazoo? And we all went, yep. So, so it just, it was a great collaboration, I feel very fortunate to have worked with her, and I'm sure we're going we're gonna to do lots more together as we go along. Everyone can visit your website. It's robertcraytonnyc.com. What is the best thing about being Robert Creighton? Well, that's an easy question right now. I have a 12-week-old son, also named Robert Creighton, <laughs> Robert James Creighton III, and a phenomenal wife who is his mother. So, I mean, yeah, ask me right now, there's just, it's no contest. That's the best thing about being me right now. Get to wake up with them every day. And that aside, there's, and that's the foundation for it all. And then I've just been really lucky. I'm, I was a little kid living north of, a, you know, a little town north of Toronto, and, and the novelty is not worn off. Like, I am consciously aware of how lucky I am to get to do what I dreamed of doing. And this album is sort of just another manifestation of the dream coming true right now. So it, I feel very, very lucky. I have a final question for you. We have listeners all over the place. What would you like to say to the people who are listening in? I would like to say that I don't think there's anyone who buys this album that isn't going to have fun listening to it. Even if you think, it, oh, this maybe isn't my kind of music, or you know, or, or even young people I've played it for. I have a lot of nieces and nephews who are between the ages of 18 and 23 who... Five foot two and ain't she sweet isn't top on their iPod list, and of course they're biased. But I, they've all got the album now, and I've gotten great reviews from even that demographic. So I think I'd love people to hear this music. To it'll be an album that you can play, put in the car, and just when you're you need to pick me up, it's something you can put in, and it will and it will accomplish that. And I hope people have a chance to hear it. Well, Mr. Creighton, I thank you very much for this interview. It's been a pleasure oh, to pleasure. speak with you. Thanks, Paul. It's been great talking to you. Thanks very much.